How's everybody? Sorry we're starting late, but I had some issues with my phone. I'm not sure why Facebook's not letting me go live on my phone. And it like started switching stuff that I already had on my phone, so I don't know what's going on. But I hear people with 5G's having issues, so that's probably what it is. So we're using another phone and we're trying something out, so we'll see. Hopefully it will work. Hopefully everybody's online can see. But we will know here shortly, I guess. So we are going to be in session two, which is titled Renewing My Mind. So renewal. This fella needs a complete overhaul. We'll use a scripture from Romans 12:2. Not to be conformed to this world, but by tra being transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is one of the sayings that, that John Ortberg put on here. It says, becoming the best version of yourself then rests on one simple directive. Think about or think great thoughts. People who live great lives are people who habitually think great thoughts. Their thoughts incline them toward confidence, love, and joy. Trying to change your emotions by, by willpower without allowing the stream of your thoughts to be changed by the flow of the spirit is like fumigating the house of the skunk smell while the skunks continue to live in your crawl space. But God can change the way that we think. He's the only one that can. He's the only one that will. We just have to let him. Hopefully, all of this stuff will work. Vintage English motorcycles, uh, Triass Nortons and GSAs, and um, we're, I do have an aerial that's uh, that's in the works. It was a PT special, as they called it, and uh, it was a special Bonneville. Bonnevilles were the the fast ones, but the PT was a special. They were racing machines, and you could get them at that time. So I started saving my money, and eventually I got one. You have to have vision. You have to you have to be able to appreciate what the potential that a particular piece has and understand some of the, uh, the difficulty of, uh, of the transformation to get it from where it is now to where you want it to be. The way I live will inevitably be a reflection of the way that I think. True change always begins in our minds. And the good news is that God can always change the way that we think. In fact, he wants to transform you into a new person precisely that way. The Apostle Paul said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What makes people the way they are, what makes you you, is mostly the way you think. So becoming the best version of you rests in a sense on one simple directive. Think great thoughts. People who live great lives are people who habitually think great thoughts. Their thoughts incline them towards confidence or love or generosity or joy. Trying to change your feelings by willpower 
without allowing the stream of your thoughts to be changed by the flow of the spirit, it is kind of like fumigating a house of a skunk smell while the skunks keep living in the crawl space. I've tried that, by the way. It doesn't work. But God can actually change the way we think. Our thought patterns become as habitual as brushing our teeth. After a while, I don't even notice them. I get so used to bitter thoughts or anxious thoughts or selfish thoughts, I don't even realize I'm having them. One of the great barriers to a flourishing mind is sometimes called mindlessness. It's like my body's at the breakfast table with my family, but my mind is not there. My mind is ruminating over my problems, a kind of repetitive, anxious, dull, low-grade obsession with tasks and challenges. I am absent-minded. That's an interesting word. My mind has gone apeful. Other people can tell I'm not fully present because my face is less alive and responsive. I talk less. And when I do say something, it's kind of terse. Uh, I don't set out to do this. It simply becomes a habit of my mind. That's why the psalmist prayed, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. God actually knows my thoughts better than I do. And God will help me learn what's going on in my own mind from one moment to the next. So in a sense, the spiritual life kind of begins with paying attention to our thoughts, monitoring our minds. As I do this, I find some thoughts that are unwelcome visitors. I get anxious, I catastrophize, I envy. But I'll also begin to recognize what kinds of thoughts the Spirit throws me. The Apostle Paul gives us a wonderful kind of framework for understanding which are the thoughts and the attitudes that come from the Spirit. Paul says, the mind controlled by the sinful nature is death. But the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. So it works like this. Take any thought. Take thoughts that feel weighty, that I find myself turning over and over in my mind, and ask this question. What direction do those thoughts lead me toward? Do they lead me toward life, toward being God's best version of myself, or away from Him? And when I find thoughts that lead me towards God and His life, that's grace. Sometimes if I've messed up, those thoughts may have elements of pain in them, but they never paralyze me. They bring energy. They're true, and they give me ground to stand on. Over time, I realize if I can keep my mind centered on these kind of spirit thoughts, then right feelings and right actions are likely to flow out of my life. The prophet Isaiah said that God will keep us in perfect peace if our mind is stayed centered, rooted on God. And this is what it means to live in the flow of the Spirit in our minds. Very important to understand, you cannot stop thinking wrong thoughts by trying harder to not think them. But you can do something else. You can learn to set your mind. This is the most basic of human powers that God has given us. You have the power place your mind to choose what you will pay attention to at any moment, including like this one right here while I'm talking to you. You can direct your thoughts in one direction or another. It is within our capacity to set our minds, and this explains why two different people can be in the same set of circumstances and yet have completely different experiences. Setting your mind is a little like setting a thermostat. It's creating a target for the planet. When you set a thermostat, the heat or the air conditioning have to click in to adjust in relation to the weather. It's a constant process. The goal is a system that's life-giving. And that's the way that it is with our mind. Our circumstances will always change. But many people who are troubled by negative thoughts try to tell themselves to stop thinking negative thoughts, which immediately brings to mind the very thoughts that we're supposed to stop thinking. There's another way. Paul says, set your mind on things above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. Or Paul says, those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. This is the better way to set my mind 
of the goodness and availability of God. Now, God's gift to you of your mind is unbelievably miraculous. Let's talk about it for a minute. Before you were born, your body had produced about 200 billion neurons. You had such an embarrassment of riches that by the time you were born, you had already killed off about 100 billion of these neurons, and you'd never even missed it. And then they make connections with each other. They give you the power to think and react. Between your second month in the womb and your second birthday, your body was producing 1.8 million synapses per second. We're not even tired. The thoughts that you think have enormous power over your life. You know, even as recently as 20 years ago, researchers thought the adult brain was genetically determined and structurally unchangeable. But they have found now that well into adulthood, the brain is amazingly changeable. It has what's called neuroplasticity. What synapses remain and which ones wither away depends on your mental habits. Those that carry no traffic go out of business like bus routes with no customers. Those that get heavily trafficked by your thoughts get stronger and thicker. The mind shapes the brain. Neurons that fire together actually wire together. In other words, when you practice hope, you practice love, you practice joy, your mind is actually, literally, rewiring your Precisely because we're made in the image of God, we have the capacity for what could be called directed mental force, the ability to direct our attention. But there is a fundamental battle in the spiritual life being waged by the evil one over the nature of the thoughts that run through your mind. The ultimate freedom you have, the freedom that nobody can take away from you, even in a prison or a concentration camp, the freedom to decide what your mind will grow in. So the idea is, I set my mind to look for the presence and goodness of God always in my life. And this is what allows me to tap into this river of living water that Jesus talked about that can flow out of the core of my mind. Sometimes my emotion might be leading me down a destructive path. But the Spirit always offers another way. I'll give you an example. Somebody might say, you know, I'm in love with this guy. He's married. I know what's wrong. I can't help him. Well, actually, you can. Because we're never just victims of our thoughts. You can pray and ask the Spirit to help reset your heart. You could, if you wanted to, spend an hour a day, every day for a month, with women who have lost their husbands to infidelity. Listen to their stories. Look into the eyes of their children. Hear their betrayal. See a broken promise through their eyes. And you will find yourself thinking new thoughts really well. And in the flow of the Holy Spirit, your feelings will change. See, at any moment, I can turn my mind towards God. The Holy Spirit is always flowing, always wanting to renew our minds all the time. I can ask the Spirit to guide my thoughts. I can do that right now. I can pause. I can listen. I get all this hooked up so everybody can hear me better on the thing, even though I still can't. I don't know what's going on with my phone. 
Shut it off. Turn it on. Still won't let me go live on Facebook. It turned it back to daylight and I'm supposed to be on dark. But who knows? So we're going to... You don't want to know what I'm thinking right now, so... This Facebook's not my friend right this second. To change the way that we think, we must start by learning to monitor our thoughts. You know, a lot of... I'm wondering if because I shared a thing with the table with the soldier you know for memorial day being empty and all that stuff a lot of people have been sharing it and they've been going to facebook jail so i don't know maybe that's it pretty sad you can't even put stuff on there about your country anymore so this is always true two people in the same situation can have very different experiences this is why i tell people don't ever tell somebody you know how they feel don't ever tell somebody, I understand what you're going through. No, you don't. <laughs> Especially when people are grieving. They always say, I've been through the same thing you've been. Still don't mean you know how that person feels. Still don't mean that you can understand to a point. I mean, everybody's different. And this one's right there because it says one may see something as a problem and the other one's going to see it as an opportunity. You know, so we have to be careful. Now, are you one of these people that looks at it as the glass is half full or the glass is half empty? How do you think when you look at things? Do you always look for, do you always think the worst or do you always try to think the best? Depends on the situation. True. I mean, we always want to try to think the best, but a lot of times it doesn't happen. You know, the, the worst always comes into my mind or in y'all's mind, and you're like, and then later on you look back and go, huh, it wasn't that anyway. But we do it. And to think great thoughts. So as we learn to monitor our thoughts, we must set our mind and decide what we will think about. So we must have thoughts that incline us towards things such as confidence, love, and joy. These are all things that move us towards God. So using that continuum there, assess your propensity to regularly think great thoughts. Where are you at on that? Do you rarely think great thoughts or all the time? Or somewhere in between? Anybody? Any of y'all think at all? <laughs> Well, how can you increase your habit of great thought thinking? Do your best to focus on him. Don't focus on anything or anyone else. Him. Yeah. Just sit for a second and then meditate. So life-giving fuel now, to equip us to think great thoughts, we need to provide ourselves with what is considered life-giving fuel. One highly effective tool in our thought life is God's Word. God loves us whether or not we read the Bible, but He has given us the gift of Scripture to help us flourish. So why would we not read it? So you don't have to answer this out loud, but how often do you read your Bible? I know Sunday night, those that were here, I challenged them. I said there used to be a game back in the day called Double Dare. And they would have, I dare you, I double dare you, and then I decided to take the physical challenge. So I double dared those that were there and whoever watched on Facebook to wake up 15 minutes earlier every morning and start reading your Bible. Don't know how many have done that, but I promise you, if you do that, you will see a difference in your life. God will do things that you've not seen or you've been waiting to see. So what's a practical, concrete action that you can take to feed your mind with Scripture more regularly? What's something that you can do to start reading the Bible? What would motivate you or compel you to read the Bible? That's true. Right? I 
challenge them even to wake up and don't turn the TV on. Don't even grab your phone. Go grab an actual Bible where you can turn the pages and read and see what happens. Don't wait for something bad to happen for you to go grab the Bible and start looking for answers. It's kind of late then. God's already been trying to talk to you and we just didn't want to listen. I mean, it's never too late, but you kind of waited a little longer when you could have been stronger and prepared if you were reading before. So we look at freedom. Now, freedom can mean different things to different people. So what freedom do you personally treasure, such as to come and go as you please? No laws right now against practicing Christianity? Which ones, what, what are some personal freedoms that you have and why? What, what do you like? What do you treasure? Anybody? Y'all awake? Past year, we've kind of been, that's been taken from us to some extent. That's right. Tomorrow might not be here. Might not make it. Your car? So what freedom do you have when it comes to your mind and thoughts? You have to remember there's a spiritual battle that's being waged by the evil one against you and your thoughts. So we ask ourselves, what is the danger? to you and those around you if you choose to not monitor your thought life? What could be the danger? That's right. A lot of people don't think there is. But like I said before, there's not one unbeliever and not one atheist in hell right now. They believe. But what control do you have in that battle? Without him, you have no control. Jesus says without him, you can do nothing. He is the only way. And if we don't let him, that's the key. We have to let him in. We have to let him control our thoughts. All right, Miss Sharon's not here tonight, so y'all get your Bibles ready. Some of y'all are going to be able to get in. Somebody want to look up Genesis 29, verse 20? And then somebody else go to Matthew 13. We're going to do 44 through 46. So let me know when somebody gets to Genesis. Yep, Genesis 29, 20. So I did this to let y'all read so y'all can get more active or interactive. Who's that Genesis 29, 20? Okay. Who's got Matthew chapter 13 that wants to read 44 through 46? There'll be plenty more, so you'll have enough for everybody to try. Matthew 13, verses 44 through 46.
So, So what was just read there? What kind of desire did Jacob, the one man, and the merchant all have in common? They had a fleshly desire. Think about it. Jacob was thinking about Rachel, and the other guys were all thinking about money and stuff like that. Have you ever experienced this kind of desire or dream for something or someone? We all have. You know, it's, it's, it's human nature. We, we all have. Have you ever considered where your desire came from? And can you connect it to your passions or your gifts? Some of our desires aren't bad. Especially if you have a desire to walk closer with God, to get closer to God, to do more for people. You know, those desires are wonderful. But when you have a desire that all you think about is, i got to make more money. I want to get a higher paying job so I can make more money. And all you think about is money, money, money. you got to be careful. Because God's going to show you what it's like not to have it. Just so you can depend on him. Now this is scary, but you ain't got to answer it unless you want to. Think back over your thought life for the past several days. What was the pattern of your thoughts in general? Were they positive? Were they discouraging? Were you worried? And did you find yourself consciously aware of the kinds of thoughts that you entertained? Or were you not even thinking about why you're thinking about it? Over the past several days, what, what's, what's consumed your thoughts? Anybody? Right? Anybody else? Anybody? You study for the test? <laughs> Some people say, you got to take tests at the doctor's office, you better study. I ain't going to lie to you, mine? Oh, my goodness. Um, a lot with, with my buddy that just passed away. And then we met with them all last night to go over what the service is going to be for Friday. So, of course, my thoughts have been like, okay, Lord, what do I do? What message am I to give? How am I going to get through this? Starting, starting to think about that, thinking about, okay, I got this school assignment I have to do online. I got this one that's due this weekend. I've got this paper coming up, and, this, and I'm like, I still got to do a, ser a message for Sunday. I still got to study Sunday. I'm like, so my, my thoughts are all over the place. And people always wonder why, why are you so tired all the time? My mind's going. It won't stop. Even at night, it just won't. I have to pray. I say, Lord, you got to just let my mind rest. Some days it does. Some days it doesn't. Have you ever had that where you go to bed at night and you wake up seeing like you're more tired than you were when you went to bed? That's how I was this morning. I've had like no energy all day. But it's always good because it, these thoughts are, are drawing me to God, not away. That's why we got to think about what thoughts are, are bringing you to God and what are you pushing away from God. So we've got to be careful. Who wants to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5? No one of y'all in that middle table should get this. Come on now. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. going to be in the New Testament. Chapter 10, verse 5, 2 Corinthians. Oh, she got it. Go ahead. But if many of them have been misled, it is 
That's Second Corinthians. Se That's all right. Second Corinthians chapter ten. Just one more book over. That's why I had to get big letters on mine. <laughs> all right. Second Corinthians ten verse five. You don't got second Corinthians yet. We'll see. There you go. So is so we learned some other Bible verses. Uh huh. Too blurry. So is it is it common practice for you to take your thoughts captive to God as the Bible tells us to do? If not, what makes that hard or easy for you to do? If we're totally truthful, we probably don't always take them captive. You know, it's kind of like we don't sit there when we start thinking of something. We should stop right then and say, Lord, help me with what I'm thinking. I don't understand this. I don't understand why I've got this. But a lot of times we try to figure it out, so we start to dwell on it even more. And it ends up making things a whole lot worse. You've always heard the phrase garbage in, garbage out. So when you consider your thoughts, were there times this week that you allowed garbage in or consciously entertained thoughts that you knew you shouldn't? Maybe you had bad feelings towards somebody, bad thoughts towards somebody or something. Um, garbage in, garbage out. We have to be careful what we put into our mind. There you go. Your diet is not only what you eat. It's what you watch, what you listen to, what you read, and the people you hang around. Be mindful of the things you put into your body emotionally, physically, and spiritually. Listen, your mind is a powerful thing. When you fill it with positive thoughts, your life will start to change. If somebody can do this quickly, I want you to read the entire chapter of Psalms 139. This is a wonderful psalm. Psalm 139. You got it, Michelle? Well, they're probably going to follow you, but just go ahead and read it. Thank you. 
the way that mothers can express vulnerable So if you were to highlight any verses out of that chapter, I would highly recommend verse 14, where it says, For I am fearfully and wonderfully made, in verses 23 and 24. That is a wonderful chapter. Think about it like this. If God already knows the psalmist's thoughts, why does he ask God to test them? Think about it. He already knows what David's thinking. Why is David asking God to test him? Keep him humbled. So what is the benefit in bringing our offensive ways to an awareness or to our awareness and to God? What's the benefit for that? Or if you are having bad ones and you confide in somebody, you won't act on them. You can ask them to help you pray about it. So what role might forgiveness play in allowing us to flourish? We don't forgive then we're un, we're being controlled by what we have not forgiven david asked god to search for sin and to also point it out even to the level of testing his thoughts this is considered exploratory surgery for sin if you ask god to search your heart and your thoughts to reveal sin in your life you will be continuing in god's everlasting way sometimes we have to say lord show me if I've done something wrong that I might not remember or realize. And he will. I promise you. He will, he will let you know. Okay, here's three different ones. If somebody wants to do either Romans 8, 5 through 8, Colossians chapter 3, 1 through 2, or Romans 12, 2. Who 
Whoever gets the one of them, just let me know which one you got. You got Romans 8, 5 through 8? All right, go ahead and read that one. Right. Who wants to do Colossians chapter three, one through two? One and two. What's that? You can read it if you want. Colossians chapter three, the first two verses. Check your thoughts up above. Who wants to do Romans 12, 2? What is the common theme in these passages? How would you define set your mind? What controls your thoughts? Think about it like this. Who or what controls your thoughts controls you. Okay, so we have to start wondering who or what is that. How do you determine what to set your mind on? Those verses just told you. Set it on Christ, set it on things that are above, not things of this world. Then what results will you experience when you are controlled by the Spirit, and in what direction will your thoughts lead you? about it like that if we would allow that to happen the churches would be full today because everybody would think about Christ all the time and doing his will and not forsaking the assembly but we let our minds go other places and tell us to do other things and when it comes to doing anything for God that's why the Bible says the flesh and the spirit are always fighting against one another who are you going to let win Got to think about that. We've got to let the Spirit win. So what kind of thoughts do you have if you are controlled by your sinful nature, by the power of this world? Badly. With the good preachers or the bad preachers? Hopefully a revival would, would break out within each person. If they have the right shepherd, I guess you could say, or under-shepherd. No, because they don't they don't preach the word of God and they and they don't preach on sin. Um, they're more about look at me, let me tickle your ear. I mean, I still keep asking y'all for a jet, and I ain't got one yet. But it's one of those things that a lot of them one 
maybe was never called by God and they're out for themselves. Or Definitely. There's, there's a big difference in being called by God and calling yourself. And it's one of those things, and, and, and sad as we got things today that tell you all you got to do is take this class online and we'll give you your license as a preacher. I'm like, that's not how that works. Sad part is a lot of them are doing it. And then a lot of them have turned away from God and followed their own thoughts. And that's what I'm saying. The Bible says man will do what's right in their own eyes. Well, where are they getting that from? Their thoughts. They're not taking them captive. They're not speaking to God and letting God deal with them. So as you reflect on what we just read, what did you hear the Spirit telling you to do in your own life? You don't have to answer that, but just think about it. When you read God's Word, it's going to speak to you, as long as you're willing to listen. Not like what it says, not like what it says. It depends on where you're at in your life at that point. I mean, it's just one of those things that, that we have to realize that God's in control. God is what he's doing. He's got your best interest at heart. We can't trust him. It does. Because that's the way it's written. You can't just take one verse. You gotta take it all. This is something out of one of his out of his book, because Griffey wrote a book about this session, about the whole thing, but it says when we tell people they ought to do something, we take that ought in ways. The ought of obligation and the ought of opportunity. Now the first kind is our duty. You ought to pay your taxes. You ought to keep your dog on a leash. You ought to take your driver's test, even though some of them don't need to be driving. The second kind gives us life. You ought to taste this cake. The ought of Jesus' message is mainly an ought of opportunity. So it's like this. When we become aware of this, we feel guilty because our desire for God does not run deep enough. But we cannot make ourselves desire God by telling ourselves that we should. God is so gracious and patient, wanting us to want him, that he is willing to work with this kind of honesty. That is why we are invited to taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste is an experimental word. It is an invitation from a confident chef. You don't have to commit to eating the whole thing. Just try a sample, which is taste. If you don't like it, you can skip the rest. But the chef is convinced that if he can get you to take one bite, you're going to want the whole enchilada. I've said it before. Try Jesus. If you don't like him, the devil will always take you back. You ain't got to worry about that. He's right there to take you back when you don't want Jesus any longer. So do you sometimes struggle with wanting to desire God? If so, how do you picture God and his demeanor towards you in that struggle? See, a lot of times we allow the devil to put thoughts in our minds about God that's not true. We allow the devil to tell us that God's mad at us. God's upset with you because of what you did or didn't do. And then we start feeling like we're not worthy enough. Well, listen, we're not worthy at all. It's only by his blood that makes us worthy. So we have to realize, quit letting the enemy tell you things that are not true. Take those thoughts captive. Go to God and say, God, are you saying this? God, is, am I feeling like this because I'm, I mean, and ask him. He already knows what you're thinking, so it's not like you're telling him something he didn't know. But be honest with him, because he wants honesty. Anybody have anything on that part? If I can get this one real quick. Psalms 34, verse 8. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. 
So does this verse affect your perspective of God's heart towards you? If we trust Him, He's going to bless us. I mean, it's that simple. And how can enjoying all that God created help you to taste and see that the Lord is good? How will it help you? Anybody? Song says, trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. I promise you, if you get a hold of God, you will definitely realize that when they say, taste and see that the Lord is good, you're going to be like, that's the best thing I've ever had. But we got to look at it like that. And in James 1.17 it says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So have you ever considered that desiring God can be receiving pleasure from the good gifts in your life? All good things come from above. They're from God, whether you people want to believe in that or not. You know, I mean... Things just don't happen by accident. There's no such thing as coincidence, and there's no such thing as luck. It's not going to happen. Isaiah 55, 7 says, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon we have to forsake our unripe our thoughts. Get rid of them. Put your thoughts towards God. Live for Him. Obey Him. Love Him. Give Him everything you've got, which is yourself. Trust me, I know when it comes Wednesdays, your body's like, why do you got to drive all the way there to go to church? Sundays, people are like, ah, oh, that's my one day I can do something. Sunday night, you mean we got to come back Sunday night? Ah. Oh. Well, you won't have to this Sunday night, but yes, we do have Sunday nights. And it's like I tell people, I said, I made God that vow because I wanted my, my weekends off where I could be here every Sunday. He gave me a position to do it, and I have to honor my vow. Sometimes we have a good crowd, sometimes we don't, but you miss a good time on Sunday nights. So the me that I want to be, taking control of our thoughts, we have to re- New our mind. The renewed mind is a canvas on which the Spirit of God can paint. Think about it like that. The renewed mind is a canvas on which the Spirit of God can paint. And then this one. God equips us with the tools that we need as well as the strength that we need to change our thinking. It's up to us to put those tools to good use and to rely on the Holy Spirit as He empowers our lives. That's how we do it. You have to let go and let God. You just have to just fully say, Here I am, Lord. I can't do it. I've tried to do it. I'm messing it up. So take control. You've got to let Him. And when he does take control and starts changing things, don't get mad. Okay? It's for your good and maybe the good for those that are around you. You've got to let him have control. Any questions, comments? Y'all like this one? I mean, I wouldn't know it because you're so quiet. People are going to think, is there anybody even here? Or am I just looking at the camera myself? But, uh... Thank goodness. But uh, just a a quick reminder, please continue to remember the Draper family on Friday. 
remember me on Friday as I try to do the service and then do the graveside service after. Uh, don't forget, ladies, this Saturday at 10 a.m. is Sisters in Christ. I hope you will come and fill up this social hall so Michelle can teach y'all about a lady in the Bible. I don't know which one she's picked, if she even knows what she's picked yet. So be much in prayer about that, but it's at 10 a.m., ladies, so try to be here. Um, also Sunday, uh, we will have our normal service in the morning, 9.15 is prayer. 10 o'clock is Sunday school, and 11 o'clock is service, but due to it being a holiday weekend, we will not have evening service this Sunday. So I will, I will remind everybody, I will do a calling post so that some will get it, uh, but just realize that it's just because we have Memorial Day, please don't forget what that is, what it means, and honor all those that, that paid the price for us to be free. I mean, it's it's got to remember that freedom was not free. Um, Christ even died to give us the ultimate freedom, but many men and women have died to keep us free. So let's not never ever forget that. Uh, I know Cleve and them weren't here tonight because Cleve's not feeling well. Um, I don't know if he's getting sick or what, but Paula texted me and told me that he wasn't gonna make it. So. Let's just remember him. Continue to remember Miss Z as she continues her um, chemo treatments when she does them. Of course, Brother Rogers still trying to heal, so remember him. That's right. <laughs> that is one thing I can say about Brother Roger. If he ain't here, something bad has happened or he had something come up that he can't get out of. Other than that, very, very faithful. And... Uh, Remember my father-in-law, he just had his knee replaced two days ago, and he's healing, have to go through rehab and all that stuff. So, so many people having things replaced and done and this and that. But uh, all hearts and minds clear. All right, well, we want to thank you for allowing us to be here tonight, Lord. I want to thank you for those that came tonight, Lord, and those that wanted to that weren't able. And, Lord, we pray that you would bless each and every one that's here and on Facebook and, Lord, we ask for those prayer requests that were mentioned that you would just be with each and every one. Lord, when we leave here tonight, please keep us safe as we drive to our home that you've graciously given us, Lord, to be able to live in. And, Lord, bring us back Saturday with the ladies that they can come and have a wonderful time learning more about the women in the Bible. And, Lord, bless us on Sunday morning as we come back to worship you, to study in Sunday school. And, Lord, just I pray that somebody would get saved. And we ask all of this in your name we pray. Amen.